and welcome to another episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. I am your host Scott Haskin, and I am here to, you know, share the love of one of my favorite artists, Lee Kerslake, most known for the drummer of the band Rai Heap, as well as Blizzard of Oz. If you know the song Crazy Train, if you know the song Easy Living, you have heard Lee Kerslake play among uh, hundreds of other songs he played on. And uh, before he passed away. He gave us his uh, his dream album, and I'm so glad that he made it. It took over three years to do it because of his health. However, with inspiration of the people around him and with his desire to you know put out something he always wanted to put out, he made it happen. And um, we're going to be going through all of those songs in in just a couple of moments. First, I want to let you know uh, this is a uh, a week where I'm releasing three episodes. If you haven't listened to my interview with Steve Weltman, who was the manager of Lee Kerslake, as well as Ken Hensley, and my good friend Paul Newton, who has been on the show a couple of times, um, you should really listen to that because he has a lot of insight into uh, both Ken and Lee's lives. He tells some great stories and some stuff I didn't know, and I was very excited to learn. So if you haven't listened to that, stop this podcast right now. Go back and listen to that episode first and then dig into this episode and Ken's episode because I'm releasing all three at the same time. Um, and Steve is such a nice guy. Uh, you know, I, I talk about that on the last show and you'll hear that when you go back and listen to the last show. So do that. Now, uh, if you're still with me or if you're coming back from listening to Steve's interview, welcome back. Um, just a couple quick things. I want to let you guys know that the uh, the new album that I'm working on is uh, is now completely written. All the tracks are are done. I have to start recording it now, which uh, by the time this will air, I've already started the recording process. Um, it's going to be a little difficult to, to do this one because my shoulder is still injured and apparently is going to be uh, several months of recovery. But I think I'm well enough to uh, to record the drums and bass, although I may have to do them in, in you know chunks uh, just because of however my arm is feeling that day. So I, I don't want to do anything that's going to injure myself more. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to not record. I think I've got enough mobility in it now to be able to do it. So uh, it's going to be an interesting process. Uh, nonetheless, probably the weirdest way I've ever recorded an album. I think this is what my 29th, I think. So, you know, I've, I've done things some different ways, but I've never I, I don't think I've ever re recorded anything while I've been physically incapacitated. So uh, yeah, but either way, you know, if that doesn't work, uh, I'll find some other way to make it happen if I can't play on those tracks. But uh, either way, the album hopefully will be out uh, around mid-August. And um, other than that, the Uri Heat podcast is doing great, guys. We are in our, our 12th season right now. We're almost halfway through the catalog. We are working on um, on the album Fallen Angel, the last of the John Lawton vocals. Uh, or is it? Because it's it's actually not. As we get into the album Conquest, which has got to be the weirdest situation of any album that I'll be reviewing on that show, um, because there's kind of two versions of it, or two versions of part of it, I should say, with different vocalists, and um, it's weird. But um, in any case, it's a lot of fun. It's a great album. So if you haven't checked out Uriah Heap, the Magician's podcast, it is located what, on whatever app you're listening to this podcast on. And if you're streaming it through my website, if you look up at the top of the website, there is the link for Uriah Heat Podcast. Click on that. All of the episodes are there, every single one of them. So you can find the episodes, uh, the most recent episodes on the player on the main page. And then if you go into the season number uh, for whichever album it is, and you go to any song that you like, anything that is aired up to this point, there is a player for that episode. And you can just click on and listen to the episode for that particular song. I am reviewing every single song that they recorded in the studio, and uh, at least if I can get my hands on it, there are some bonus tracks that I have not yet been able to hunt down, but I'm getting pretty close, and uh, there's only a handful left that I know of that I don't have. So uh, as they are working on their next album, I'm almost halfway through the catalog, uh, so they're going to have another album out before I get there, but that's okay, because that just gives me another season to do. And I'm really excited about it, having a lot of fun with that show. And of course, this show as well. I've got some great interviews lined up for the near future. Uh, it's really uh, difficult right now with everything that I have going on to try and schedule interviews. But I've had a couple of really interesting ones come my way that I'm really excited to bring you guys. I did say I would bring Michael Shavak back on the show to talk about his other book, because we really only got to discuss one the last time he was on. 
So he will be back this month. I cannot wait to speak to him this coming week. Uh, he's such a nice guy. He's so energetic and passionate about his work. I, I really enjoyed talking to him. And I was excited to get him back for another round of questions and interrogation because you guys know how, uh, you know how aggressive I can be. <laughs> or not at all. Uh, so anyway, that's enough about that. Let's talk about Lee Kurz. Like I, I love his drumming. He's the one that taught me how to play the double shuffle, even though it was one thing I, I could just never really be that good at for some reason. There's, there's a different relationship between your limbs when you're playing that style of music, but he was certainly a master of it. Uh, as I've talked to Russell Gilbrook and, and shared his videos where he shows how to, how to play the double shuffle. But I first heard it on Easy Living, and it was, uh, boy, that was hard to, to even really physically get to the point where I could play it because it was just so different from what I was used to playing as a drummer. And um, I love Lee's playing. I always have. I've loved the way that he addresses drum fills and transitions. Um, I find it interesting that he really, uh, at least through the Uriah Heap times, really wasn't big on the ride cymbal. You know, it's it's kind of a surprise when you hear him turn to it. He's mostly a hi hat guy, and uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. I I think it, he plays just fine. Um, it's just that usually, you know, drummers will will switch off a little bit more than he does. But uh, that's okay. You know, he had a great style. I love the feel of his playing. I love the sound of his drums most of the time. And it was years before I knew that he was the drummer on Crazy Train. Had no, I just never even bothered to find out who it was. And so that was kind of interesting. I had played that song probably a hundred times as a drummer before I knew it was him that was uh, the drummer on the actual song. So he has, uh, you know, such an amazing history. He didn't write a lot of songs as Steve and I talked about, but man, just, just the song Come Back to Me Alone uh, you know, if somebody can write a song that could touch me that much, and that is off the album Fallen Angel by Uriah Heep, um, if, if he can write a song that touches me that much, to me, that makes him a great writer, even if that was the only song he ever wrote. And so that's kind of how my position falls on that. If you say, you know, he was a great writer over a span of time, over a larger body of work, well, he really wasn't because he didn't have that many songs that he wrote. But he did leave us with this absolutely amazing album. And as I said uh, in my interview with Steve, I really love the the design and the packaging. And normally, I absolutely hate CD packaging. It's it's fairly pointless to me. I would rather have slightly uh, more minimal audio and and not even deal with CD packaging. But to be honest, I love what they did with with both uh, Lee's and Ken's. I think the packaging is great. And honestly, just the pullout sheet with the lyrics and all these stunning and beautiful pictures alone would be worth buying the CD over downloading it. Um, you know, I did both. Um, <laughs> it's kind of weird because Steve was so kind. He had the record company ship me uh, both vinyls and CDs for both Ken and Lee's albums. And I reached out to him not too long ago and I said, well, I just wanted to let you know, you, you know, because I'm the kind of person that if somebody sends me something, I'm going to let you know I got it. I'm going to say thank you. Um, you know, I appreciate that because they didn't have to do that. They could have said, you know, yeah, you're, you have a right to re review the albums. Go get them and put them on your show. And but he was very kind and had had them send me that. But the package never arrived. And he checked with the record company. And sure enough, it was delivered to my zip code. But I have one of those, uh, you know, logins with our uh, postal service where I can they'll notify me of packages coming and things like that a couple of days in advance. I never saw anything for this. Um, so I don't know exactly what happened, but in any case, it didn't reach me. So when I let him know, he was kind enough to send me out another set of CDs. And believe it or not, I got those from England in about a week, which is really shocking. And, it, and um, I was expecting a good month or so. And that's why I had waited so long to tell him I didn't get the other ones, because I figured it was going to be a good three or four months with COVID for something coming from England. Um so I don't know how it all worked out, but it did. And I got these beautiful, absolutely stunning CDs. And Honestly, guys, like I said, the photos alone are enough to go and buy the physical CD for. So, uh, and also the liner notes are very beautiful. Mick Box put in some wonderful words. There's some great words from Lee Kerslake as well. Um, it's just a, a, an amazing thing. And the uh, the opening track, Celia Sienna, there is a beautiful video for, her, and I have the link to that in the show notes. It's on YouTube. Um, it was so wonderful to see, you know, Lee so full of life in that video. Um, there's clips of him singing the song in the studio. Uh, there's a lovely little moment at the end that I'm not going to spoil for you. It's it's so worth watching. Um, but, you know, Mick was in the video and, and some other people. And uh, it was just really nice to see. And I love that Lee was able to sing on this album. I, it would not have been the same, I think, if he had to go out and hire somebody because he wasn't able to do it. 
Um, his voice certainly is a little deep on this album, which is very understandable. I mean, if you have any idea what his body has been through up to this point and why it took three years to record it, but you couldn't tell. I don't think the recording suffered for the time at all. You know, it sounds very cohesive. It sounds like it was all recorded at the same time. It was very well done. Just a, a beautiful piece of artwork. Now, as I said uh, in, in my interview with Steve, I really feel like this was just the work of somebody who said, I know this is going to be the last record I'm going to be on. And I am in control of it. I am going to do this my way. I'm going to put out music I want to put out. And when I had mentioned to Steve about the, the negative interviews I had seen, and I'm really glad that they weren't ones that he had seen earlier, but people were bashing songs like Port and a Brandy, saying that it was just some old man sitting at a bar being recorded and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know, I, I think those critics and, you know, take music critics as they are, you know, most of them come from a position of superiority of, I know everything about music, so I have a right to say what I think and what I think is what is right, you know, because I'm a critic. And, and I, that's why so many people are, are negative when it comes to music press because there is a, a different perspective on it. But I think if you listen to this album with the perspective of Lee made the album he wanted to make, he put out the, the music and the songs he wanted to put out, then I think you'll approach it from a different perspective. If you're looking at this to be, you know, this is the, the profound Lee Kerslake making his musical masterpiece, I think you're going to be disappointed because I don't look at it as a musical masterpiece. I look at this as a very humble album, a very passionate album, an album that, was was what he wanted to say. And if you're doing just what you want to say, it's not necessarily going to be a musical masterpiece. You're not looking for technicality and you're not looking for finding, you know, oh, this this guy played this solo, so I got to get him for the record, or this guy's really hot right now in the public eye, so I got to get him to play on a song. It's not about that. It's about saying the things that you want to say in the way you want to say them. So if we approach this album from that perspective, you're going to find a lot of enjoyment in it. I think the songs are beautiful. I think the the lyrics and the delivery of the lyrics are very passionate. Uh, I love the sound of the album. I think the recording of it was beautiful. The mixing and mastering was fantastic. Um, this is going to be, obviously, you know, spoiler alert, a very positive review. But for me, these songs are also very emotional because I didn't get to meet Lee. I, I was near having an interview with him, but the timing was just as horrible as it could be, as, as I talked about in my interview with Steve. But uh, I was at the NAMM show where he got his uh, presentation and I was there and I didn't know that Lee was there. Otherwise, I would have certainly made a point out of going and meeting him like I have with other people. Um, unfortunately, it was the same with Keith Emerson. I, I didn't get to meet Keith Emerson before he passed. Uh, and I had planned on doing that at the next NAMM show. However, uh, I did meet Steve Morse. I met Glenn Hughes. I met Alice Cooper. Uh, it, you know, the NAMM show has been very kind to me over the years. But uh, unfortunately, I missed meeting Lee. And I think that's part of what makes this a little bit tough for me to listen to is because I, I won't get the chance to meet him and to say, Lee, thank you for everything that that I've learned, everything that I've enjoyed. You have a massive amount of work that has been very important to me both as a musician and as a fan of music, because every artist that I adore in that manner, uh, it really comes from from the heart of both of those directions, because as a musician, there's a certain level I appreciate on, but also just as a fan of just being someone who enjoys listening to good music, there's a different level I appreciate things on. And um, so I, I won't ever get the chance to tell him that. So uh, the very least I could do is put this out there and let people know about this album that that don't already know about it and how wonderful it is. And just share the love of it, because that's really what uh, what music is all about. So let's listen to the first song, uh, the one that there's a video for. It's called Celia Sienna. No, no, it just can't wait The time will pass us by Before we know it 
Well, first off, the mix of this, I think, is just fantastic. It sounds so rich and full, yet musically, it's very simple. I mean, just the acoustic guitars, a little bit of organ, you know, some light percussion, you know, very simple, but it just sounds so full and wide. I love that. I love the way his voice is not overbearing. It really cuts through everything just just beautifully. And he sounds great, doesn't he? You know, his voice sounds really powerful. And of course, you know, again, this is spread out very much over time, but uh, I, I think it has such a great sound to it. I love even just the opening, you know, just that hi-hat, the shaker just in the background of it, not out front, um, just just a really nice blend. And it's such a beautiful song, um, great lyrics, and definitely check out the video. I love the colors that they use for the video because there's times where it's kind of sepia tone, sometimes where it's in color. Um, it, it's just a a beautiful thing and there's really a story that goes along with it um so go go and check that out like i said it's it's worth it and it's a great song um i think it's a great album opener too i think it kind of sets the tone for the fact that this is not going to be a hard rock album if that's what you were expecting from a career hard rock drummer and you never really know when drummers are going to put an album out you never really know what you're going to get you know if you listen to cozy pal's tilt versus phil collins uh face value uh, you know, they're two completely different albums from from drummers. Of course, Phil is a vocalist, too. And and so, you know, he's going to have a different approach to his own personal stuff. But you really you really never know what you're going to get from a drummer putting out an album. But a hard rock drummer, especially the expectation is it's probably going to be a hard rock album. Uh, but no, this is a very beautiful album with a lot of lovely melodies, a lot of passion and emotion in it. And uh, definitely one that I'm so grateful that uh, he was able to finish before he passed. And so uh, let's take a listen to the next song. It is called Take Nothing for Granted. Okay, well, it's it's kind of a rock album. <laughs> I didn't want to spoil it, but uh, great song, solid track. Really appreciate the aggression on this one. Um, it's it's always interesting when someone's singing about love and they're glad that they have love. That there's that adrenaline in the track. I love when they do that because that's really kind of how it feels, right? You you find somebody, you like them, they like you. Things are are happening and it's exciting, and your heart is just racing. So why wouldn't you have? you know, something uh, aggressive or at the very least assertive to represent that, you know, to to kind of, you know, show you show the world what your heartbeat is at that moment. And it's very exciting times. Um, very strong vocal on this one, very strong drums. Now, the, the one thing that uh, is a little bit difficult for me is that this album is somewhat Brickwall Limited as well. And um, anybody who's heard me review a Brickwall Limited album knows I don't like that. Um, for me and my my personal feeling is a lot of times you lose a lot of the dynamics of the music when you brick wall limit. Um, but I think in this case, the album was mixed well enough to where you do hear a lot of those dynamics coming through. And that's the real trick. It's almost like if you know the album is going to be brick wall limited, and a lot of times those are two different engineers that do it. So the mixing engineer doesn't necessarily know that's what the mastering engineer is going to do with it. But uh, if you do know, you can compensate for certain things. You could do your panning a little bit differently. You could do your volumes a little bit differently to kind of set it up for the fact that if all the, vol the volumes of, e of every frequency are going to be pushed to the max, then you're going to leave the, the space and the, the, you know, the area for them to be able to do that and still make the album sound good. So unless you're super, 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 super lucky you really want to know ahead of time that, that that's what's going to happen. It's almost like if you know who the mastering engineer is, give him a call. Is this what you plan to do with the album? Because I'll mix for it being Brickwall Limited if that's what you're going to do. 
Uh, so I haven't really talked about it that much on this show. I think the Dead Daisies album was the last time I talked about it. But basically what brick wall limiting is, is it's taking all the frequencies and pushing it to the max volume so that when you look at the waveform of the audio, and it's called a waveform because it looks like a wave that it goes up and down. A brick wall limited song doesn't look like a wave. It looks like a brick wall. It's just a, like a, an almost perfectly solid block and or series of bricks. You know, and that's because everything has been pushed to whatever that top limit is that they set, whatever the top shelf is. They say, we don't want it any louder than this, but we want everything to be that loud as much as possible. So when you do that, you lose a lot of the dynamics and and things in the music because they aren't being featured. You know, you can't have the volume of the guitar solo be out that much ahead of the rest of the song because everything is being pushed to the max that it can be. So you lose the dynamics of it. And uh, if you're able to mix for that, you know, you can use panning to put things in different places in the sound field so that even though everything's being maxed, if you listen to certain areas in your headphones or, you know, uh, you listen to what's in the center, you start listening to what's to the left, you start listening to what's to the right, you can still pick some of that stuff out. Whereas if everything is just maxed pan center, pan left or right, it's just all going to be a bit of audio soup and you don't want that. So I think that when this was mixed, It had to have been mixed knowing that that was coming because it really does feel separated. There's still a lot of stuff you can hear. I think some things are are probably being lost in those dynamics, but for the most part, it sounds pretty good. And this is a great song. It's a good, solid rocker. It's nice to see, or or hear, I should say, it's nice to hear Lee sounding so strong in his voice that he could pull off a song like this and uh, just fantastic. It it really, it was a surprise to me because with the, the opening being so mellow and acoustic, I really kind of expected the the whole album would be mostly valid, ballads, but man, this song kicked in. I'm like, wow, okay, I really have no idea what to expect from this album now because we've heard two completely different songs out of hearing two songs. So where is it going? And that certainly made it um, you know, even more exciting and interesting to hear. And so now we move on to the third track called Where Do We Go From Here? Which is funny because that's that's what I'm talking about. So at first, it sounds like it's about aliens coming down and and taking us away with that synth opening. Uh, But then it kicks in with just a really kick-ass drum beat. I love the sound of that. I love the dynamics he's playing on the hi-hat. I love how huge the drums sound in this song. Um, And then the telephone kicks in, and I'm like, okay, I don't know where that's going. But it had a a nice addition to the rhythm, actually. I thought that fit in rather well. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the guitar sound uh, is fantastic. The two guitars that are playing on it, a uh, really strong and powerful song. Um, I love it. For for kind of a ballad, it really is very heavy. And uh, it just has a, a great drive to it, really, without having to be fast. The one drawback is that I think the vocals are a little bit buried in the mix. I like that they that they put that effect on it that makes it sound like he's, you know, on the other line of a telephone. Um, at the beginning, but at the same point, it kind of buries the uh, the tone because he's singing in a little bit lower register, um, kind of blending in with some other things in there a little bit. But it's still, I mean, it's clean enough to where you can hear what he's t- what he's saying, which is the most important part. Because in a song like this, it's it's about the message as well as the music. And if you're not going to hear the passion in the message, then it's you know somewhat of a, a of a lost song. But overall, I think the song sounds really strong. Um, I love the feel of I love the double guitars. Um, the drum sound is just phenomenal on it. And it's, it's one that I've, I've enjoyed. Um, you know, I've only listened to this a couple of times 
because I didn't want to, um, I really wanted my uh, thoughts on it that I share on the show to be fresh as I always do, but I had to listen to it ahead of time. I, I, I waited a couple of days and I'm like, I need to hear it. I just need to. And then I listened to it again um, just because I wanted to. And uh, so my opinions are still pretty fresh. I mean, this is only my third time hearing the album, but I could hear there being a potential commercial opportunity for this too, or something that even could play in the background of a movie, you know, that, that needed something that had like a phone ring in it and that kind of hit those beats uh, of the message. But uh, I definitely think it's a very strong and powerful song. I, I really enjoy it. And I'm glad that it's one that he decided to share with us. Um, the next song on the album is called You May Be By Yourself, But You're Never Alone. Stop that crying, darling. Please, come here. Come on. Oh, there you go. Now, that's it. Don't cry. Daddy's here for you. I'll take care for you. I'll take care of you. I'll take care. It's going to sound strange, but when I think of singers like Wayne Newton, for example, who could just go out with a backing band and just play, uh, you know, sing on stage where the stage is kind of large and really most of it is is his area and the band is just kind of around the edges to support him. Um, you really have to be a strong vocalist for those kind of things and to sing songs that would encapsulate a crowd. But I will say, when I listen to Lee sing this song, that's what I picture. I picture him to be just on this really big stage. You know, there's dim lights kind of around everywhere to show that there is a stage and there's an edge to it. But really the focus is on him and he's just standing there singing to the crowd, You know, maybe walking across the stage here and there. But his voice is so good on this song that I could really see this being something that you could pull off live with like epic fashion, you know, fireworks going off at certain spots and uh, just, you know, the crowd sitting at their table, having their drinks, just being completely enthralled. Uh, that's just what the visual is that I get when I listen to this song. Obviously, it's a very beautiful message um, written, you know, if, if it's a literal translation, obviously written for, a, a, you know, a, a child to let them know that they're they're always okay. You know, there's always somebody that has their back and, and is there to support them, which is an absolutely beautiful message, especially for a child. Um, I think the baby crying w was maybe a little, a little much at the beginning. Maybe less of that would have been nice because that's a sound that I think most people are, are very turned off to. But as soon as it starts to drift into the music, I mean, all that chatter is just immediately taken away and you're, you're just absorbed by the music that, that takes it over. I do think the drums are a little quiet in the mix on this one. I think the guitars are, are overpowering them a little bit. I think uh, a really solid snare with a tambourine on uh, every other snare or maybe even every snare would have brought out a little more pop and power to it. But I think for the most part, it's just a beautifully written song. I think there's uh, a little improvement that could have been made in the mix, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, I said it many times, audio engineers are very opinionated people. And as I get older, I find that I get more opinionated. But, uh, you know, we all mix our own way. We all mix to what we hear. And I can only say I'm not listening on, you know, huge studio monitors the way it would have been when it was mixed. I'm listening through some nice studio headphones. But, uh, you know, obviously everywhere that you listen to it is going to sound a little bit different, too. So maybe if I listened in the car, uh, I would be hearing heavier drums as opposed to on my headphones. I don't know. But in any case, it's just a beautiful song. And that's the that's the thing that should be focused on. It's just it's a song that's sung with with such tenderness and care and and love that it's it, it can be really overwhelming. And a song, you know, that that uh, much like Come Back to Me, which is about a breakup. Uh, and Lee's first song that he wrote, it's uh, this has that same power for me. It's something that I could listen to again and again and still just my heart would be full listening to it. And that is that is some powerful writing. 
So uh, he may not have had an immense catalog as a writer, but I will say what he's what he did do was pretty fantastic, in my opinion. So um, you also may have noticed, too, that, you know, normally I play the clips are about 30 seconds. I've been doing about a minute on this album because he's got longer intros. It's a little longer before the vocals come in. And I want to feature those at least a little bit so you can get a taste of them. Obviously, I'm highly suggesting you go out and buy the album. Uh, If you want to download it from iTunes or Amazon, that's fine. The links are in the show notes for that. My suggestion is purchase the CD, as I said. Get that booklet, get the pictures, really immerse yourself in the experience. Get those beautiful words that Mick Box wrote and that Lee had to say, you know, at the end. um, Just beautiful stuff. So take advantage and and, uh, get the physical CD on this one. I don't always recommend it. I'm I'm very much uh, an ecological person. I care about what I do to the environment. And if we have, you know, ways of skirting physical stuff, I'm I'm often a big fan of it. But sometimes there are just some things that I think are worth having that that physical piece. And this is certainly one of them. Um, I know that you collectors will probably get the CD and the LP and all that, but uh, make sure that you get the the pictures and the liner notes because they are so well worth all of that, you know, every bit of it. Um, so that's uh, that's half the album already, guys. We've already gone through four songs. There's a total of eight. The next song is is a bit of fun. You know, it's uh, it's just a, a bunch of people hanging out, having a good time, and it's called Port and a Brandy. Hey, Lee, we're almost all here now. Why don't you get on the piano, play some of them songs we go. Let's get the party started. Soda, any kind of drink will do. I'm in the saloon, but fighting my time. The Yanks will be here, ten up to nine. Loaded with pay safe up for tonight. Here come the lads. It'll be a looking all right, boy. Well, I love the sound of the piano on this. I mean, it's really, uh, it really takes me back to the idea of being in like a, a candlelit bar where maybe the floor is actually dirt or straw and uh, there's just a bunch of people and they're drinking out of their cups and, and having a good time. And uh, I love the walking bass line to this. It's perfect for this style of music uh, right down to the end of the song. I think it's absolutely fantastic. I love just the, the lighthearted banter Throughout it, you know, uh, people that are supporting the <laughs> the performer while actually drowning the supporter or the performer out at the same time. Uh, that happens a lot. Uh, I've been to plenty of shows where there's people that are, you know, in the middle of the song. They're screaming to support the song, but yet they can't hear it. And other people around them can't hear it because they're supporting the song. It's just a weird combination of things. But in any case, I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's a great song. I think that, uh, you know, the la di di da da part um, is, is nice. I think it goes on a bit too long and it's a little confusing at the end because I don't know where they're going. It sounds like they're, they're maybe out traipsing in the snow. So maybe they're going back to their wagons or, or whatever, and and heading home from the bar. But I love how it switches from the foreground to the background. I love how it's kind of off time because they're drunk and, uh, they change it up a a little bit because they kind of lose their, their pace. Um, I think it's just a, a lot of fun song, uh, for a song. And, you know, lyrically it's all about, you know, different kind of drinks and having fun. And that, so it's it's a really good song, I think, that would have been performed in a place like that. Uh, but for me, I just I just picture it. Maybe it's because of the the style of piano. Maybe if it was a more modern sounding piano, I wouldn't see it this way. But with that sort of ragtime honky tonk sound, uh, it really just makes me feel like this would be like in the eighteen hundreds and uh, or or maybe the early nineteen hundreds, and just you know a bunch of friends sitting there you know playing the piano there's candlelight there's there's straw everywhere or hay or peanut shells or whatever it might be uh, i just picture those olden times you know everybody wearing like uh you know leather vests and, and cowboy hats and stuff i don't know maybe i'm completely off the mark on that that's just what i picture when i hear the song and uh, i'm not responsible for my brain well i am but you know what i mean um, but no, it's it's a great song, and and I really have to again look at the the reviews that I saw of this, and 
just, you know, looked at how they really talked down about this song. But honestly, I think it's a lot of fun. I think to have recorded a song like this, I could I could picture, you know, everybody in the booth, uh, maybe even not recording it in a vocal booth, but just recording it in the open area with a bunch of chairs and a bunch of microphones and everybody just kind of sitting in a circle, looking at each other, bantering back and forth, and then just capturing that all on uh, on tape and overlaying it on top of the pianos and vocals. Um, I think the the bass is, is great. I think it's just a great song. And this one, I think, is pretty well mixed. Um, I don't find it unreasonable that some of the background dialogue was drowning out the vocal. I think that's very realistic of what it would be to be in that bar watching the song performed. So I think this is very well done. In fact, I think the production on it is fantastic. I think that this is probably one of the best mixed songs on the album. And uh, kudos to taking a chance and doing a song like this, because I think a lot of people, even if they would have come up with that, this idea, they wouldn't have put it on the album. And so kudos to Lee for doing it. I think that um, that's that's a very brave choice just because of the the you know expectation that you might have of what the critics would think of a song like this or what people in general would say, since we have the Internet now and everyone has a voice and we have podcasts and people like me have opinions. <laughs> and, and I do. Uh, so moving on to the next song, it's called You've Got a Friend. And I know this song, uh, by James Taylor. You know, that's the, the version that I've always heard, just kind of him and an acoustic guitar and some other instruments joining in along the road. But that's not actually the case. Um, it, it's, it's just a beautiful song that was written a long time ago. And I'm going to let you hear his version of it right now. So the original version was by Carol King and James Taylor uh, did his version of it. And, you know, it's it's weird. I find personally that most of the time when there's multiple versions of a song out, it's usually the one I hear first that I like the most. And I'm very familiar with James Taylor's version. Um, you know, it's played a lot. I haven't heard it in a long time, but I don't really expose myself to music that much anymore where I would be in a position to hear it. But it's uh, it's a beautiful song. You know, the sentiment of it is very um, so supportive. It's, you know, this this really should be one of the theme songs of the day. You know, we should be telling people this. All these people that repost like, oh, you know, I want 10 of my friends to post a suicide hotline and all that. No, you should be playing this song for them. This is the thing. These are the words that you should be saying to people that you care about in your life. Screw playing the song. You know, tell people that you care about them. And I love the delivery of it. It's very gentle. It's very from the heart. You really feel that he means these words, not that he's just singing the notes on the page. He really means these to whoever he's singing this to, whether it be, you know, uh, his family, his friends, his fans, whoever it is. I feel that there is so much heartfelt truth in the performance here that it's it's really overwhelming. To me, it's almost hard to listen to because it's so emotional. Um, this would be one that I would probably want a brandy you know, before, although I really don't drink brandy or, or drink very much at all. Um, but it's uh, it's definitely a beautiful song. And when I first saw this title on the, the list, I thought, well, I wonder if it's the James Taylor song, because I, I keep forgetting that Carole King wrote it originally. And uh, but again, that's because I knew the James Taylor version. That's the one that stuck in my head. But I have to say, I, I like this one better. I, I really do. I think that James Taylor's version is good, but I think it's um, it, it doesn't touch the emotion that this one has for me. This one really won me over very quickly. And I love the sound of it. I love the strings. I love I think that's an oboe at the beginning. Um, just just the power of it, the, the multi layers of the vocal. There's just so much going on. Yet again, it's such a simple thing, 
but it's layered very beautifully. It's mixed very well. Um, I I don't think that I really could want anything more in this version of the song. I think it's fantastic as it is. And uh, if he was going to do a cover, you know, this really seems to go along with his message. Uh, you know, if you if you look back at, um, you know, you may be by yourself, uh, you, you get the uh, idea of he's he's just somebody that cared about people and that wanted to be there for them and support them and let them know that they're not alone. And those are all very beautiful messages. And I'm I, I love when people that are in a position to deliver those kind of things to a large amount of people. You know, if you're a celebrity, you have a fan base, you've got a lot of followers, whatever it is. And you take advantage of that and say, there's something that you should all know and really deliver it like like he does on this. I think that's about the most beautiful thing that a famous artist can do. And I'm really glad and grateful that he put this song on the album because it's uh, it's a beautiful one for sure. So as we uh, as we round down to the last couple of songs already, uh, this seems like it's gone by so fast. Um, the next song is called Home is Where the Heart Is. You guys catching a the theme here? So this is just a, a good, solid rock song. Um, it's it's a great way to uh, get close to the closing of the album, um, because like so many albums, um, the the very closing track that we're going to hear next is uh, very different from the rest of the album. So it's like this is really the last um, edgy or hard rock song on the album. But I have to say, uh, it's really strong. The drums are fantastic. Uh, not a surprise when you consider the talent that Lee had, but thinking of his physical condition, um, this this came out absolutely great. Um, I love that guitar keys intro. I, I think it's uh, it kind of returns me to that idea of the aliens again. So I don't know if there was some sort of a subtext in there somewhere on the album that I'm not getting, but uh, I really like that. It was really different. I love the way it kicks into the rock. Um, there's there's a good interesting stop in there that the first time I heard it, I'm like, whoa, that really felt odd. And it took me a couple times of going back and listening to it before I was like, okay, yeah, I, I get it now. But for some reason. It uh, it caught me a bit off guard. Um, I think these are some of Lee's best vocals on the album, to be honest. Um, I think it's uh, very powerful. He sings so well on it. But again, the the volume of the vocals versus everything else is uh, is a little bit limited. I think they could have put him up another four or five decibels on the volume scale, and he would have been uh, right where he should have been, just a little above everything else. Right now, it's parts of it blend in a little bit, but the performance is absolutely phenomenal. I love the power of the song. I love the guitars on it. I think it's just a, an amazing piece of rock and roll. And, you know, if you're if you're going to go out and say, this is the last thing I'm going to do, man, he he did it to the hilt. And I think he really just unleashed on this song. Um, a very powerful one. But yet, at the same time, it has just such a beautiful message. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's weird when you have, you know, such a, a good driving song and then you just have a beautiful message inside of that beat. It's uh, it's it's a really a nice contrast because you would think it's going to be all you know aggressive and about demons and dark things and whatever. But no, he's he's really singing with with passion here, and it's uh, it's just a beautiful piece of music. So uh, it's one that I'm definitely you know like everything else on this album, I'm very glad he put it on here. I think it suits the album very well, and uh, definitely check it out. Check out the whole song. It's it's worth your time. I promise. Um, now we're going to change things up a little bit and we're going to get to the last song on the album. It's simply called Mom.
is a, a very powerful song. Uh, it's all instrumental. And uh, you really get the feeling, though, of his emotions, thinking about whether it's his mother or the mother of his children or, or something. Um, I'm not sure. But it's, it's a playful but sad song. It's, it's full of longing, but it's also filled with, with joy. It's a very powerful instrumental song. And um, it does have, I, I felt the ending was slightly abrupt. I kind of expected the, the strings to carry out a little longer than they did. But maybe there was a reason for that. You know, maybe there's a, a message in that um, that things sometimes slip away before we want them to. Um, certainly, certainly the case with Lee. Um, but it's got a beautiful pizzicato. There's a lovely guitar solo in it. Uh, it's, it's a very powerful and emotional song. And that could be easy, but it also could be very difficult to pull off in an instrumental, you know, without someone telling you what to feel, as you would have a vocalist do you really have to let the music carry you away. You almost have to be willing to think of yourself as, you know, a cushion or, or like a, an inflatable floating on the water and just letting the water take you where it will and being willing to accept wherever it takes you. That's the way I kind of view instrumental music. I think it's very uh, easy to misread it because there is no specific guide. So instead of trying to figure out what it means, just feel it. You know, and you don't have to necessarily feel the same thing that the composer felt or that the performers felt. As long as you feel something, that's the most important part. If music inspires you to feel something, then it's done its job. Because other than the title, you've got nothing to go off of what was in Lee's head when he wrote it. Now, I don't know how he wrote it, because being a drummer, I don't know what other instruments he might have played. Um, but So I, I'm not sure how it all came together. Maybe he hummed it, sang it into a voice recorder, and it was transcribed. I, I don't know. But it, what, I, what I do know is that it's a very powerful piece. I think it certainly has a place on the album. I think it's a great last track and a great ending for the album and, and sadly for his career. Uh, Lee was somebody who I admired greatly as a performer. Uh, I've learned so much from him as a drummer. Uh, I didn't really know until more recent years that he was a backing vocalist. I had no idea he did that. Uh, that's a, a huge challenge as a drummer to do even just regular backups, but be uh, able to do a high harmony as well as play drums at the same time. That really takes a certain a certain skill. And he was a big guy. That's what's always impressed me about him as a drummer, too, is that he was a big guy. And, you know, larger people, and I don't mean fat, he's just a big, like a wide framed guy, but he, it's harder for, for, you know, guys like that to move faster, to be accurate. But when you listen to his work, uh, you know, listen to Return to Fantasy, the song Return to Fantasy from the album Return to Fantasy, listen to his drum fills, listen to how he's keeping up the pace with that double shuffle. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. You know, Easy Living is a fairly short song. It's a couple minutes, you know, you can get through a couple minutes doing a double shuffle, but you know, a song like uh, Return to Fantasy, that's that's a tough song to play for most people. And to be able to do it with the gusto that he does it and to put in those really amazing drum fills it, for a guy that big, that is just absolutely fantastic. I mean, he he certainly took advantage of his abilities and used them to the fullest. There's no doubt about that. And He's someone that I definitely appreciated uh, and will always appreciate uh, throughout the rest of my life. When people die, we don't stop appreciating them. Um, I'm sad I never got to meet him, but I'm very grateful that he gave us this album because I think it really gives us an insight into who he was, what he felt, how much passion he really did have. And, you know, we don't get to see that in drummers a lot of times. Drummers often, you know, they they really do hide behind their drums. They don't write songs. They don't write lyrics. Uh, if we do, they, they, if they do, a lot of times we don't know they have. Um, they're behind their drums. They don't do interviews as, as much as other people in the band. Uh, good, drummers are, in general, fairly shy people. Uh, there are a lot of great interviews with Lee out there on YouTube. In fact, there's one that he did with Bob Daisley. I think it was bef right before Bob Daisley's book came out. I'm not sure, but it was a wonderful interview. Um, it was nice to see how well they interacted together. I mean, clearly they were really dear friends. Um, there's material out there. So I would highly suggest go find it. Find, uh, you know, find the, the reason behind the passion. And you can certainly hear and feel the passion in this album. So I definitely encourage you guys to, to check out the full album. It's an absolutely beautiful piece of artwork. It's not an, an album that, you know, would necessarily get a lot of radio play. It's not something that would have been 
you know, in the top 10, it wouldn't have probably been on MTV. Um, but it's, it's an album that is very noteworthy. It's a very much worth listening to, but let go and just listen to it. You know, close your eyes. Don't think about anything. Don't have any notions of what you think it's about other than, you know, what you've heard here. Be very open-minded to let the songs take you where they do and to let the emotion of the performances and the writing and the vocals, just let them consume you and feel what you feel. I think that you'll have an amazing experience if you do. So thank you guys for joining me for my review of Lee Kerslake's album, Eleventeen. And stay tuned if you're listening in real time for the next episode, which is coming out right now. And that is my review of My Box of Answers from Ken Hensley. Cheers. Cheers.